open mind, you will see what's going on, especially from the, the mathematical standpoint. But okay, you know, Keith, you know something? We're, part of the reason I told you about that model with the numbers mm -hmm. is we constantly hear this from news directors and, and, and editors. Oh, well, do you have credible reportings? And that was part of this whole whitewash over the last, uh, since 68, is did you ever notice that, that, you know, oh, hey, there was a UFO sighting and they go out there to some trailer park or some farm and, and, and put a camera in front of somebody. And, uh, and when it cut back to the anchor, he would roll, he or she would roll their eyes. Okay. Uh, signaling, oh, this isn't a credible person. And, and that's why these Navy pilots have been getting so much press because they are considered uh, trained observers and, and quote, credible. And I think the thing about the preliminary report that really um, uh, pissed me off, and I'm going to say that word, was the fact that they were throwing the pilots under the bus. They were throwing the technology under the bus. Okay. But, you know, one of the things that weren't, weren't, isn't being said I met some of those guys from the Princeton, that's the rate advanced radar ship. They've got the top of the line at that time, the top of the line technology on that radar ship protecting the carrier group, which is at that time was the Nimitz. And I talked to a bunch of these sailors at, including their chief petty officer at, um, at, uh, the Laughlin UFO con uh, conference. Uh, in, in about a year ago, about a year ago, or actually in 2019, 2020 messes this up. It's like a lost year. Uh, but uh, these guys were telling us they couldn't tell anybody. They were sworn to secrecy, but their reality had been changed because of what their pilots were experiencing, and what they saw on radar, and they saw the performance of this thing dropping from 80,000 feet to sea level in like n almost nothing. Okay. And some of these guys, because they couldn't tell anybody, lost marriages over it because the guys were stressing out and the wives went to the natural spot. OK, who is she? You know, that kind of thing. And so there's been a human toll with all of the secrecy and with the, the whole cover up of this topic matter. And it really needs to come out and our academics need to get involved with this thing and get sobered up. So, yeah, we need the government to come clean and say, yeah, this stuff is real and get academia, properly trained academics to start analyzing this stuff. And it's important right now. Um, like I said, we got an underpaid librarian and retired uh, uh, analyst doing this kind of work. And this is this is what is wrong. In fact, um, we're getting ready to send a, 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 a letter to Senator War Warner and Senator Rubio with the stats for their state, with the maps and their uh, plotted UFOs by their by their zip codes, you know, to show them, you know, yeah, it's great what's going, you know, going on with the Navy. But how about the rest of the freaking country, guys? You know, there's more to this. And I'm really, really concerned that when we do have congressional hearings, they are not going to bring in the civilian experts who have been studying this stuff for years. And, yeah. I, and it just breaks my heart that Stanton Friedman's dead because he'd be one of the key. Everybody that was on that uh, citizens hearing would be appropriate people to be in front of Congress. I agree. Um, I, I was so pissed at that nine page report they had 180 days to come up with this report they should have had 180 pages no nine pages and all it says is well we don't know what they are and the task force didn't come up with enough information to, to, to determine what they are they know what this stuff is they've known they're, since approach, they're approaching it from the oh we got to prove it thing oh see linda and i did not take that approach we just said let's just measure what's measurable here instead of trying to prove what it is or who's who's from i know you got to go to break yeah we're coming up on the break um so yeah this is to me this is us coming to a major head and somebody's got to blink and i think the guys who've been sitting on this for the longest time they're the ones 
who are going to have to blink because the technologies that are coming out right now, they can say, oh, these these people des- developed this. They just discovered that. And just like Philip Corso said, he told them, you come up with the way you discovered this, but you never saw me. And he'd give them the technology so they could reverse engineer it. But now we're, we've got stuff coming out of the woodwork all over the place. And they're going to have to explain where it's coming from. Okay, you're on the other side of midnight, and uh, we'll be right back after this break. Midnight.com. Tune in to listen to Richard C. Hoagland and his fascinating guests. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. As a Club 19.5 member, you'll gain access to the rest of this show and all previous 350 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Support the broadcast that provides you with the most interesting conversation available. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. The other side of midnight.com. Talk radio with pictures on demand. Liberate your hyperdimensional time scale and non linearly access over 400 hours of conversation at the cutting edge of science and thought. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive content that fits your interests and time schedule. Filter episodes by guest or subject. Membership costs $9.95 a month, $0.33 cents a day. Listen while you travel or as an environment to your endeavors. $0.08 cents an episode, $0.02.5 cents per hour of content. The other side of midnight.com. To the other side of midnight, your <clears throat> your hosts are uh, Kanthea and Keith Morgan, and we're heading into our last half hour. Um, we're going to come back to uh, Cheryl and Linda now, and this is getting good. I love it. So, we're we were talking about uh, the the implications of what these guys are trying to hide and what they have to do to get out of the hole that they dug for themselves. And <clears throat> I have an idea, but uh, Cheryl or Linda, you got any ideas how these guys could dig themselves out of this hole they've made for themselves? Well, okay. There's been an effort over the last three or four years to bring this stuff out to the public. Okay. Um, had at least the inside people in D.C. who are lobbyists for our community. Uh, when um, Trump won the election, it was a bit of a surprise. And it had Hillary won, we probably would have had this disclosure conversation 
couple of uh, five years ago. But uh, the talk was that um, if Biden won, then it was, we were going to definitely go down this route of a level of some level of disclosure, probably congressional hearings, bring more of it out and uh, just basically generally get get the public acclimated to the idea. And all the best people, I'm sorry, uh, all the best people that I've talked to um, about this down in D.C., seem to think it's following this track um the one thing that that nine page thing did they used the word threat and the word of of security about eight or nine times so this gave the this gives the uh, committee chairs uh, the leverage they need to call for congressional hearings so it'd be interesting to see uh what they do there is another report coming uh, because this was the preliminary report uh and uh, there's a there's a saying about putting a generation a, a preliminary report. You gave them something. You delivered something. And in in government contracting terms, sometimes you can't have it exactly the way uh, they what they requested it. But you give them something. Do not miss a deadline and not give them something. Okay. So I that's what I have expected. I have expected that they were not going to deliver the goods that the UFO community had. But notice that it has what they did deliver loosened up the media tremendously. Uh, there was an article. This article I mentioned earlier in the program. They did a story of a Gannett, the Gannett papers in upstate New York. There were five of them. A story was written out of the. Um, uh, written out of the uh, Binghamton, New York uh, uh, paper uh, about the UFOs. And the guy interviewed me, me extensively on the phone, and he also got together with our MUFON director and interviewed him. It was a huge story. And uh, the headline literally was, Can They Really Be Real? Okay. That, and it was a front page story. You know, and, uh, you know, my, my mother's in Gorning, New York, you know, and she, my God, my, my kid, my kid's front page story here, you know, so uh, and I'm about UFOs that that, that was a big deal. And uh, so we're people are loosening up and starting to talk to us. Their the media is starting to take this approach. We have to start treating this stuff as if it's real. Get over the shock. Back when ATIP was talked about, back in December of 2017, uh, a lot of people said, actually, February of 2017, there was a release that was uh, uh, Henry Kissinger cables from back during the Nixon administration. But there was some UFO research stuff posted. Now, the CIA used to take an approach of saying, oh, we're not studying this stuff. Back in the 70s and 80s, they said this. But if you looked at those PDFs, and I know the P Washington po uh, uh, New York Times looked at them very thoroughly, as I, did I. And I downloaded a lot of those PDFs, and there was at least one there that was uh, from about 1950, 51, uh, to Department of OSI, the Office of Scientific Investigation within the CIA, were pulling their hair out because there was this monthly pattern associated with UFO sightings. And they were pulling their hair out, and there were notes in the margins. Is this due to asteroids? Is this summer madness? What is causing this monthly rise in July and, uh, uh, July and August? Okay, they had about 129 sightings to gather data from. Here we are in, 2000, in 2017 with our first book. Uh, we had 5,900 sightings, and it, there is a definite peak in July and August, but we've discovered that it was primarily northern states. You go to New England or anywhere across the top part of the United States, uh, it it's got a level number a uh, level number of sightings till about May. It starts to tick up a little bit. July and August go through the roof, and then it tra trails off again a little bit in September, and then it goes for October, November, December. It trails off to that quiescent level that we see around spring, what we call the winter level. And we we seem to feel that the people who are giving those sightings are people who are out on a regular basis, rain or shine, dog walkers, smokers. Uh, people coming outside for a break at, at the factory, that kind of thing. People who have a regular schedule, we seem to think that. So 
that was that was an eye opener for us. And um, I, I guess I guess the big point that I'm making is, is that reviewing the data the way we have, we've gotten a great deal of interest of late uh, about talking about it, not just saying you know a couple of years ago people. Were, uh, couple of the news stories that were done about it was, oh, California is number one, rah, rah, rah. And of course, they didn't want to talk about anything else. And uh, we've, we've now, with all this revelation with the Navy stuff over the last three, three years or so, has gotten people into, they start Googling to try and find out information, and they find us with our book, of, our two books of statistics. And uh, that's been kind of fun to, to deal with. And as he's, especially back in 2017, when they, after a tip was talked about, uh, uh, there, I watch these morning talk shows on CNN or ABC and NBC, you know, they're talking to their, 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 uh, their, uh, the commentators and they're all sitting there like a deer in the headlights when the question was asked, well, what do you think about this stuff with the, uh, the government had this program, the ATIP program to study? And they're all sitting there saying, uh, well, um, I don't know that because they're not read, they're not up on the topic matter. They are totally ill-prepared, and they aren't willing to go out and talk to people who are prepared to talk this topic matter. And this is the big scary part. And we really, I really, really hope that the media wises up now that we're getting this revelation that the stuff is real to really talk to people who have studied this. Guys like uh, Robert Haster. Uh, he did an he did an op-ed piece for the uh, Washington Examiner about a week or two ago, talking about the fact that you know uh, has anybody mentioned the fact that these things were shutting down our missile silos for for you know in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? You know, no, that conversation hasn't come up yet, but it needs to. Yeah, it should have been the president to shut those down, but they were trying to tell us something. <laughs> they were trying to tell us something. And these guys still keep covering it up. And I think we're going to... Well, we're gonna there's one point, one point that goes with that, though. Mm-hmm. And, and this, is, this is where I'll buy into the cover-up, okay? Um, uh, there... How do I want to say this? Haster, if I ever needed a smoking gun, it was his presentation on this topic matter about our missile silos being shut down because he had documents that were declassified from other aspects of the government that talked about this stuff. And Linda and I sat there in that ball- banquet room listening to this guy's presentation and I said, if I ever needed a smoking gun, if I was ever just a, a step back from accepting that this is real, this was the smoking gun. And the funny thing about it is, is when Dr. Condon did his report to Congress, he had made up his mind a year before he gave it. Even though people in his staff said there's 30 percent here we really should be looking at and he was writing it off and he wrote that whole report in a way that it would kill any kind of scientific investigation for eh, as it's been 50 years but the funny thing is i i forgive dr Kahn. i i think he should roast in hell for it personally right that's my attitude but i do forgive him for one thing top Air Force brass neglected to tell him that these things were shutting down the missile silos and missiles. Okay? He did not know this before he delivered his report to Congress. Yeah. So, yes, there's been cover-up, but the Air Force also wanted out of the UFO business. And have you noticed how quiet they've been through all of this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because the TR three belongs to the Air Force, as far as I yeah. Well, anyway, don't go don't go to the technology. Okay. Just look at policy with the Air Force. They have been uncharacteristically quiet. And there, Lou Alessandro told me in the interview that there was middle management people in the Pentagon that would not allow his reports to get up to Secretary Mattis. This whole thing. And this, remember the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the defense intelligence groups that wouldn't touch this topic matter when the Nimitz report, uh, uh, people were reporting them and other aircraft carriers were starting to report this activity. They wouldn't touch it. They didn't want the stigma. That's why we got the UAP designation. The problem we're dealing with here, there has been, and I, I was in two military services. I served in the Air Force and served in Vietnam, and I served in the Cold War Navy. And 
there has been a drastic breakdown in the chain of command reporting structure. Information like this should have been able to be communicated up, but middle-level management was sitting on it in the Pentagon. In fact, part of the things going on right now, there's a little war going on over at the Pentagon, and they were upset with the preliminary report. There are people over there who do not want this stuff coming out. And there's a whole faction of people over there who do want this stuff to come out. And uh, I've got this on good authority. So, um, I, you know what my advice to people right now is? Don't worry about that preliminary report. Sit back, get your popcorn ready, because there's, uh, we're, it's going to be quite a show when stuff starts being revealed. I agree. This definitely, <laughs> we're just getting the show on the road. Yeah, well, do, you have, do you have more questions? Do you have, do you have more questions for Linda? Uh, well, Linda studied psychology. I'm I'm curious to explore the idea that we already have disclosure. The people already have it. So, who cares about this report? Well, I have a question. <laughs> I, I have a question for Linda. Um, uh, John Mack, uh, he went to Zimbabwe and interviewed the over 60 kids that saw the craft and the aliens and so forth. Um, these, these children are now adults. And this, the, uh, the thing is, is that they said that this influenced them in their direction in life that they took. Um, do you think that these, even though they're adults now, you think they need closure, right? Well, I don't know. I mean, the thing about closure, and I'm putting air quotes around it, is that, you know, it's like you said, that the, 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 the only thing that is constant is change. And I don't think as human beings there is such a thing as closure. There's always, it's like if you lose a loved one, you grieve, and the grief is really hard when it first starts, you know. And, you know, after a couple years, it starts to lessen and you start to learn how to deal with life again. And but, you know, there's always going to be that moment when some you'll hear a song or you'll do something and all of a sudden you'll think about your dearly departed, you know. So was there closure? No, because we're, because of the way our brains work and the, the memories and we don't even know how memory works completely, that wanting disclosure is or, or wanting closure of any kind is is in itself a desire that I think is unrealistic to expect to be be um, um, fulfilled um, I just was actually um, jo Ralph Blumenthal who wrote the uh, recent book on John Mack I think it was called The Believer and he's actually the one who interviewed us for the New York Times several years ago and um, uh, it's been interesting because he spent a lot of time sort of talking about John Mack's uh, personality and career and, you know, what kind of person he was. And it, to me, it's been fascinating because he was a very complex person. And I think it, it's emphasizing to me that all of us, you know, you, um, uh, you know, Cheryl, anybody who's involved in this, we all bring our own prejudices and experiences, and um, these these uh, uh, people in Zimbabwe. I think we saw. Didn't we see a documentary or something? Yes, recently was about that. Yeah, that was that was very interesting. And they're and, making another one about these kids as well as yeah, adults. Yeah, and I think I think that actually they're 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 being part of disclosure because. If nothing else, they're showing that, you know, this is taking place worldwide, that it's not just the, the white people in the U.S. that are experiencing this, that, you know, that it's affecting cultures all over the planet. Um, I know one of the more fascinating things I've heard is that down in Brazil and South America, they have more um, incidents of the diamond-shaped uh, UFOs. And that the culture down there is if you see a diamond-shaped UFO, you get the hell out of there because there's something always bad happens when they're seen. Hide the goats, hide the kids. Yeah, you know, so I think that there's, I think, I think there is disclosure. I think a lot of people know already. All these people that are being touched, 
um, all these people that are have even, you know, and even and Cheryl was talking the other day. She says, you know, even if you've just seen a UFO, you are now an experiencer because you just experienced something, and some just seeing one UFO can um, uh, affect your life. You know, it it makes you a different person. You are changed by the experience, and. To me, that's uh, saying that's the paradigm shift is that the, the people are being changed by all this. And that seems to be one of the um, aims of the ETs is that they're trying to change humans so they stop being so violent. So they start being more kind to each other. So they start taking care of their planet and don't trash it and, and, and assume that everything is replaceable because it's not. And it's <coughs> when we try to influence things, when we have have cultural differences, you know, the, the traditional way of dealing with it is that, well, you get a bunch of weapons and like you beat each other up. That's the way you solve problems. And that, guess what? That's not working. And I think that they've been trying to educate us and to influence us that there's another way of doing things. And they have the patience of taking decades if not hundreds of years if not thousands of years if not millions of years to to change humans one person at a time i mean just look at the patience of that the the planning of that and and they may not be coordinated there seems to be that there's many different types of et and you know it's it's like the star trek or the star wars or, that just because they're all aliens doesn't mean they all agree with it, each, each other either either but to me i'm just wowed and amazed by this whole patience of changing one person at a time and when you change one person at a time and you do it on the level of millions of people that's an amazing fact i mean they've had studies about meditation i know this sounds like it's going off the rails but uh that they've they've had you know this idea that if you go into a town and and teach meditation to uh, a group of people there uh it only has to be i think it was like one percent or something i, 1%, I can yeah. What, yeah one percent of the the population that they then document the level of violence and conflict and, and crime, et cetera. And it goes down over time. That just just calming down and, and, and teaching a small percentage of the population to think in a different way, to experience reality in a different way. Um, I had a dear friend that uh, we actually uh, dedicated the first book to Dave Singer, and he was a he was a physicist for the Army, and in fact he was one of the designers of uh, night vision goggles. So he was a brilliant guy, and he taught me. He, he introduced me to the Freudian Society and a lot of these paranormal and UFO topics, etc. And we were talking at the time about you know like the role of psychedelic drugs. And he says the reason the government is against people using drugs like marijuana or LSD or anything that makes you experience reality difference, it's what you said earlier is that, you know, if people start thinking different, it, it's it's a, a, a threat to the authority of the governing class and the governing bodies. And um, um, I think I should stop there. <laughs> Let somebody else talk, but. That's what I'm concerned about. That's why I'm involved in this. This is why I think it's really important. It's the most important thing on our planet in our history of all times. And it just really irritates me that people, oh, well, that's UFOs. They're just a bunch of crackpots, you know. It's like, no, don't you see how important this is? Um, if you want to read my articles that I wrote over seven years for the Syracuse New Times... If you go to Amazon and search for The UFO Beat by Cheryl Costa, you'll find that book. All uh, three a, books are on the webpage. Yeah, oh, yep, okay. yep. And uh, the new book, uh, which is our new statistics book, that's got tremendous analysis and displayed data on it. In it, uh, it's, it's pink. Can't miss it when you go to Amazon. It's bright pink. Um, it was designed to be pink on the idea that if uh, we ever ended up in front of Congress, we want those congressmen to have a nice big pink book written by a couple of women. And uh, But uh, it's called The UFO 
Sightings Desk Reference, United States of America, 2001 to 2020. It's Amer- the UFO Sightings Desk Reference, United States of America, 2001 to 2020, by the two of us, and uh, it's it's worth it's uh, it's worth the, it's worth the money, and it's a, it, it will open your eyes to just how big this phenomena is in the United States. Well, I have really enjoyed the revelations from both of you, and I particularly loved Linda when you were taking off there I didn't think you needed to apologize you needed to expand <laughs> that's why I usually let Cheryl do the talking <laughs> well, you know something that kind of dovetail off Linda um, I lived in a Buddhist monastery for about seven years and one of the things our Lama pointed out especially with this sort of thing is people need to be given situations that will expand their reality I've done reports where 10 people were up at some isolated lake up in the mountains and something came down. Four people saw it for what it really was, a a, a mechanical uh, vessel of some sort. Another two or three people saw it and perceived it in some kind of cartoon symbolic form. And the other two or three people didn't were staring straight at it and couldn't see it. Mm. Remember what we see we perceive with our eyes, we process with our brain. And the problem is, as one of my lamas put it, people need to expand their reality. There's a lot of stuff going on, but they are just blind to it because they won't expand their reality. And experiencers, when they, anybody, if they see a really decent UFO sighting that really makes them question that isn't a normal aircraft. And they, they start, it's just wrapping their head around it a different way. That is an expansing, uh, an expansing, expansive of the mind moment. And it will change people. And frankly, I'm happy for, I think ET's doing more sightings now. So more people will get that elastic reality. And I'll shut up now. Well... Yeah, and I think it's also time for the public to be more vocal. I, I applaud you for putting together this compilation of reports from the public, and hopefully this will encourage more people to make reports. Can you let them know where they would file a report? Um, if they go to uh, National UFO Reporting Center dot org. Um, that would uh, be the best place to go, or they can go to MUFON.com, M-U-F-O-N. I'll add those links to the page. Perfect. P- put them up there. Uh, I recommend National UFO Reporting Center because the information, uh, the raw information, will be put up. Um, they respect privacy, and you know they do a good job. Thank you. Thank you. So, any wrap up thoughts here in terms of? where you're going with this information towards the future now? Um, I'm going to be doing it. Uh, we're getting ready to do a whole series of state books with the specs of these statistics straight down to the state level for all 50 states. And then we're going to do 29 books on just the individual shapes and the statistics. If we had done this all in one book, it would have been two foot thick. And uh, by doing it this way, it will be the largest compilation of UFO compilated data ever published in human history. It's going to make it really hard for people to insist that nothing is going on when so many people are reporting. Bingo. Bingo. <laughs> I mean, <it's> like, <laughs> really? Nothing? Yeah. Two old, two old ladies in Syracuse are, make, are doing disclosure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for Thank having you us on. It. Yes. It's been fun. Yeah, it has. And Keith, I really loved your stories about Zimbabwe and all the other things that you've brought up, especially your personal experiences. I think the audience enjoys, I know I enjoy hearing the personal experience. So I appreciate Keith uh, helping me out here to fly this craft. And just a shout out to the mysterious Mr. Black. (laughs) He's probably laughing right now. It's not that the monitor is broken, my bad choice of words. It's that there's some kind of electrical thing going on. We don't know what it is. We have to still identify the problem. So, folks, you know, cut us a little slack. (laughs) 
<laughs> and uh, Keith, any last words? Oh, well, we're at that time. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to uh, continuing the journey. Good night.